I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and I am hosting this Meet the uh, Behind the Lens Meet the Experts panel uh, for a documentary film featuring Dan Kogan, the producer of uh, Becoming Cousteau, Elena Fortes, the producer of A Cop Movie, Julie Cohen, one of the directors of uh, I Am Polly Murray, uh, or my name is Polly Murray. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, Megan Milan, the director of uh, simple as water and Julie Goldman, the producer of the Velvet Underground. Um, first question I wanted to ask is uh, to Dan actually, and um, I want to know. Uh, you know, there, we there, we have such uh, a plethora of documentary content coming out now, and I'm curious as to what do you, what is your favorite thing about what documentary filmmaking is like right now at this moment. I mean, I have to say my favorite thing is the heterogeneity of it. You know, the fact that you have folks like Todd um, making a doc for Apple on the Velvet Underground, or you have, um, you know, Robert Greene making a very experimental and different kind of film that Netflix bought, Procession, or you have, you know, the incredible committed um, social impact work that that folks like Megan and Julie do, like Megan and Julie do. There's just, there is such an extraordinary range of storytelling from experimental to more broad, such a wide array of subjects. And there's a bigger audience than there ever has been. You know, and that's something that inspired us for becoming Cousteau was how do we reach an entirely new generation of people? And I think that's possible now in nonfiction in a way that it wasn't before. And that um, volume and heterogeneity and um, ubiquity, you know, for those of us who started in this business, like I remember talking to Julie 25 years ago um, when we were making films together and it was, you know, it, it, we were a tiny little niche, you know, there was just, there was no sense of the broad appeal of these films. And now they're reaching so many millions of people and they're featured on streamers and, and, that part of it is just really exciting to those of us who have been in this priesthood for a long time. Elena, how about you? Uh, I, mean, I would definitely agree. And I, I would also, um, uh, you know, be besides kind of what's exciting about these platforms taking those risks, I also think that there there's something exciting about them producing in different countries, countries because that adds to the heterogeneity of, you know, the behind the cameras. And I think that's exciting as well, that we're able to access, you know, content that is actually produced in, 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 in other places that, you know, wasn't the case before, unless you were able to go to a film festival. So I definitely agree. You know, uh, I love the whole doc world as a creator of stuff, but maybe even more as a consumer. There's just so much incredible stories to tell. I like, I, I love watching, uh, you know, multi-part series. I kind of love true crime. I come a little from the true crime world. Love to, I love to watch true crime. I love animated, like, I don't know. I, I love it all. I love music docs. I love, I love the conventional ones. I love the experimental ones. There's almost, uh, it, it, you know, it really feels, I kind of think on the viewer side, like an embarrassment of, of riches in a lot of ways. And I'm excited that people are out there. I mean, this year in particular, I've seen so many docs that like blew me away with how much I love them. So in echoing a lot of what everyone has said, I think the expansiveness of both the expansion of audience is so exciting that people don't, you know, think we're medicine any longer that this can a documentary can transport you and entertain and um, and also the expansiveness of who gets to tell stories and um, you know and and who we bring in and sort of the demand of um, a diversity of voices I think it's just and and the demand of artistry so I think it's just a really rich and exciting time for documentary and uh, Julie Goldman how about you well everyone said uh, very much what uh, my thoughts are about this but I, I mean I think it's really right now we have um, storytelling, which is about it's storytelling. You're doing it. It happens to be documentary or it happens to be a fiction film or a series. Right now, what's happening is that the story has become the focus and the creativity of how you're going to tell that story and the tools that you're going to bring to that are feeling very limitless right now because we're able to access different styles and different languages and different um, ways of communicating with each other. And I think that with documentary, it's become, it's become finally this kind of level playing field with everything, with the other, any other kind of storytelling. 
And that's exciting after all these years to have that. It used to be, you know, people would say, oh, I love documentaries. I watch the History Channel. And now it's like, I love documentaries. And they start to list all these really interesting and challenging films. And that's a huge difference. And um, next question, I want to start uh, with uh, Megan on. Um, uh, I'm always curious, with especially with documentary filmmakers, to hear uh, to hear you know what were the film the documentary films or nonfiction films that you saw that made you say I want to pursue that not just filmmaking but that lane of filmmaking. So what were some of the uh, ones that uh, uh, got you started on 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 this journey that you're on right now? I have one for every day of the week, so it's really hard to choose favorites among children, but Burden of Dreams is a film that I just remember sitting in and being like, whoa, you know, and I want to grab any piece of creating things like that. I haven't made a Burden of Dreams like film, but, um, you know, Les Blanks, uh, you know, the, the director of that, who is a Bay Area filmmaker that I really admired, most of his films were very intimate and had for me at least, um, inevitability about them. They felt just very sort of organic and loose and casual. And um, that really pulled me in. Um, and then um, a, a friend, but who was also a mentor of mine is John Els, um, who does all sorts of different styles of filmmaking, but I worked closely with him on a film called Sing Faster. I worked I worked very low down the chain, but um, very long hours and saw every footage, uh, frame of footage of a film that was looking at, um, called Sing Faster, looking at Wagner's Ring Cycle Opera through the point of view of stagehands. And the level of craft and artistry and complexity that they were able to weave in, in a story that was so much fun to watch is something that um, I always sort of try to be reminded of in that. I would say A Little Dieter Needs to Fly and Waltz with Bashir were the two films that made, you know, just a, a huge impact. Um, uh, Waltz with Bashir, just the, you know, this idea that, you know, you tell yourself stories to, to about your past and, and, you know, how to use uh, film as a as a way of accessing memories that you blocked and then animated, you know, this incredible animation. I, I, I thought that film was mind blowing to this date. Like I still rewatch it. Um, and Little Dieter Needs to Fly just, I mean, from the fact that, you know, it really made me question, you know, how bad I, I would be at terrible at, at surviving even one day, you know, in an island and just that there's just a story of this man and everything he went through. But also this idea of kind of having him re reenact those experiences in, in the places, you know, that, that became the basis, I think, for a lot of of, of, of films or maybe, you know, it, it, it had been done before. But to me, that was like the first time I saw kind of that um, play a part in 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 the actual narrative of the film that was very significant for me it's got to be errol morris's gates of heaven um it's his first film i think it's his best film it's a it's a masterpiece it's incredibly strange and emotionally powerful i've seen it easily 15 times i still don't fully understand it and it touches me so deeply every time and it really was a new direction in documentary when he made it. Um, you know, the director of Little Dieter Needs to Fly, Werner Herzog, dared him and and um, didn't believe that he would ever actually make a film and then and said he would eat his shoe if he made it. And then there's a famous Les Blank short film um, called Werner Herzog Eats His Shoe. <laughs> Herzog actually doing that, Errol cooking it and eating it after Errol made the film. It's just, it it is an extraordinary work of art and the story around it is also very rich and, um, uh, you know, it, it inspired me from the first time I saw it. And that's, uh, I think that's, that, that should have been a tagline for the movie, made on a dare. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about, uh, Julie Goldman, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I think the films that I remember, I remember seeing Barbara Koppel's Harlan County and just being like, well, this feels really different than anything I've ever seen. I, I love Gates of Heaven, but also when I saw Thin Blue Line, Errol Morris's film, I remember see, going to the, see that in the movie theater and being like, what is happening here? You know, this is, it was the, the kind of wonderful unsettledness that you feel. And, and I worked for a company selling like documentaries to the international market and to schools and universities. That was my first job out of school during college. And I, so we had like St. Clair Bourne's films and Marlon Riggs and just incredible collections of films that of these, these brilliant filmmakers. And, and I always remember Cane Toads also, just Mark Lewis's film really stayed with me because it was 
so weird and so humorous and the ability, like a lot of the films we had were very serious. And this was something that had, um, you know, a, an edge to it that was really um, playful. And Julie Cohen, how about you? Yeah, I'm going to be even narrower and say not just a film, but a scene. Uh, there's a scene in Michael Moore's Roger and Me where uh, a guy who's just been released from a mental institution is talking about his most painful inner emotions. You're seeing like a tracking shot through the falling apart streets of Flint, Michigan. The guy is saying that like when he, in, at his lowest moments, he's thinking of the Beach Boys song, Wouldn't It Be Nice as a kind of contrast to what's going on in his life. And that song starts to play as you're seeing what Flint is. And just like the emotional impact that those like 90 seconds created watching it did make me think like, whoa, like, isn't, isn't it amazing what a combination of images, music, and words can do. And like, I, I might like to do that. And um, uh, just uh, quickly, I've also, so we've talked about uh, the films that got you, that initially had that huge impact on you. What are some of the documentary films that you've seen? I, I wanna say like the last five or 10 years that have really left a mark on you. And uh, I wanna start with uh, uh, you, Julie Cohen. Um. Yeah, well, there's the date, like the ones that got, uh, so, so many, I mean, thing, I like things that are really deeply enjoyable watching experience. So at the risk of uh, kissing up a film that the other Julie produced called The Mole Agent, um, which was an Oscar nominee last year that I, you know, which is, um, I love films about old people and the beauty of old people. I worked in network news for a long time where you're not supposed to talk about or acknowledge anyone over 49 years old. Um, so seeing the richness and the beauty of elderly people told in a loving, hilarious and romantic way is one of my favorite things. And uh, the mole agent hit all those marks for me. And how about you, Julie Goldman? Thank you, Julie Cohen. I love your films. Um, you know, Man on Wire just kind of always sticks out to me as something that was, um, you know what I loved about Man on Wire? It was, I, I remember when, when Simon Chin was pitching it and, he, and, and it was after the Twin Towers had fallen and I was like, how are you gonna do this? How are people gonna watch this film? And he's like, I, yeah, I'm, we're trying to figure it out. And then he told me he was talking to James Marsh and that James had the idea of starting the film with the building of the Twin Towers. And I was like, I just love that he came up with that and that you could find joy in this space again through this moment in time where somebody just did something for the total thrill of doing it. I, one of the things I love about that film is how that opening scene, when they're talking about how they're getting into the building, it sounds like a bank heist. And it's just like, I just love how it kind of catches you off guard like that. Um, Megan, what about you? Uh, it's, it's choosing favorites. This is awful um, and great and fun. Um, you know, I'm trying to think, and this might be meant more years than you said, time goes, but um, Valentino and Pina are two films that I actually gifted people on DVDs, which I don't like non-doc people and watched again and again. They just, um, they were just transporting and fun, fun to watch. So those are two that I've been a big fan of recently, somewhat recently. There's so many good ones. And Elena? I have a lot too. I mean, that now that you mentioned Maite, I love her first film as well, La Once and, and, and The Mole Agent. Um, Leviathan is another film that made a huge impression. Um, and what else? The Arbor by Cleo Barnard was also a film I really, really loved. Um, so yeah, I guess those three <laughs> have left a, a huge mark. And Dan? Um, I'm going to say the it's either the second or the third film by my good friend, Penny Lane called Nuts. Um, and it is an insane, bizarre, baroquely strange story of a real life guy who the, the beginning of the weirdness is when he decides that he wants to be a doctor and tells men around the country in the early 20th century that if they can't have children, he can help them have children by implanting goat gonads into their testicles. And it only gets weirder from there. 
And um, uh, Penny That's does sorry. it with such an incredible sense of humor and it's such an appreciation of the profound strangeness, strangeness and the, both the sort of strengths and weaknesses in humanity that allow this guy to thrive. And it's also done in different forms of animation as well as interviews. So it mixes media in a really interesting way. It just feels like something, this special concoction that wraps you up in its own world and transports you with humor and weirdness. And, uh, you know, I love that. Well, uh, Dan, Elena, Julie C, Megan Mylan, and Julie G., Thank you so much for joining us on this panel for for uh, Meet the Experts Behind the Lens. We wish you all the best. And uh, again, just thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Charlie. Thank Charlie. Nice to see you all. Bye, guys. <laughs>